Good afternoon. I'm Matt Driscoll, editor of Asian Aviation Magazine and AsianAviation.com. Today we're in conversation with Subhas Menon. He recently took over the top job as Director General of the Association of Asia Pacific Airlines. Uh, he served in a variety of roles at Singapore Airlines Group for a large part of his career. Subhas, welcome to In Conversation and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to talking to you. Uh, there's an old saying, which is supposedly a Chinese curse, but uh, I haven't really been able to see where that's ever been proven of may you live in interesting times, and that could certainly apply now. You've taken over the top spot at the main trade group, representing some of Asia's most well-known airlines. Uh, what were your first days like uh, to take over the top job during this crisis? Well, you could say it's a baptism of fire. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I suppose um, uh, it uh, it shows that you know um, there is a commonality uh, among human societies and people um, because uh, this crisis affects everyone. It affects every country. It affects every sector, every industry, and uh, is a unique opportunity, as I see, it, you know, for the whole industry and the whole world to come together on a concerted basis uh, to survive uh, this crisis. Can, can you give us some idea? I mean, I think I, I saw you, IATA was giving a press briefing uh, probably a month ago, I think, uh, here in Singapore. Uh, and I think I saw you there in the background. Uh, but can you give us some idea of your daily schedule these days? I imagine you're on the phone a lot uh, with your member airlines, with governments and others. Uh, but are you, are you up at four in the morning trying to talk to everybody and get things going and, and uh, as aviation tries to get flying again? Well, pretty much like uh, everyone else, I guess. I mean, uh, work time and free time uh, converge, personal space, professional space converge. Um, and COVID-19 is uh, front and center in all conversations, whether it be personal or professional. So it does, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, permeate, you know, all parts of your consciousness. Now, your international counterpart, uh, IATA, has warned that airlines could lose more than, uh, it was more than 300 billion uh, U.S. dollars uh, if the shutdown continues for an extended period of time. Uh, just last week, they warned that uh, Asia Pacific Airlines could see a worsening of the situation. Uh, your organization itself came out with a statement, I think it was yesterday, warning about what's going to happen if things continue. What are you hearing from your members? Well, uh, Asia Pacific Airlines are expected to lose uh, uh, around uh, U.S. $115 uh, billion dollars, uh, by the end of the year. That's a 50% uh, decline uh, from uh, last year. Uh, Asia Pacific Airlines are uh, quite badly affected because uh, Asia Pacific was the largest growing region, you know, so uh, that is expected. Um, so like all airlines, uh, with uh, flights grounded, um, uh, they are burning cash. Well, I, I just want to follow up on that. I know you can't comment uh, on individual members, but the, some of the airlines themselves, like Korean Air, uh, came out recently and, and said that they face an existential crisis, that, that it's, it's a make or break for them, that, that they could go out of business. Uh, Thai Airways is said to be in bad shape financially and, and uh, they're trying to get uh, government support. We've already seen Virgin Australia uh, go into administration and, and lots of others may soon follow that same path. Um, can you can you expand a little bit on, on the general state, not just of your member airlines in the group, uh, but Asian carriers in general? Well, generally, I think the uh, the main problem is that uh, airlines are not able to uh, uh, earn an income to be able to cover their costs. So um, they are in survival mode and they're doing everything uh, uh, they can to survive this crisis. There are probably two aspects to it, you know, earn uh, as much uh, income uh, as they can, no matter how little it might be. Uh, for example, um, most airlines are, are operating uh, um, uh, what we call um, passenger air cargo flights. In other words, carrying cargo and passenger flights uh, because the demand for 
for medical equipment and essential supplies have actually skyrocketed. So they are cashing in on this uh, opportunity, even though it's not a lot of income, but at least it's something. Uh, they're also operating uh, what we call repatriation flights by transporting uh, stranded passengers to their home countries. Uh, so in this way, they are earning uh, some income. Secondly, they need to conserve cash. So all uh, avenues to conserve cash are being explored and uh, implemented. Um, expenditure reduction, uh, wage cuts, uh, no pay leave furloughs have all been implemented. Um, secondly, um, their governments uh, have uh, generally uh, been forthcoming with uh, relief in terms of taxes, uh, fees and charges. Um, also, um, they are in uh, discussions uh, with uh, the airframe and equipment manufacturers uh, for forbearance, uh, deferrals. Uh, they are also looking for lifelines with their banks and of course uh, turning to their governments as well. In other words, do everything possible to survive this crisis so that uh, you at least uh, uh, can be in a shape uh, to restart uh, uh, what they do best, which is flying. Now, I've been listening to a lot of webinars. That is the the communications uh, means de jour these days. And unfortunately for me, most of them happen at about 10 or 11 o'clock at night when I'm ready to go to bed, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, the general consensus seems to be that domestic travel in places like China, Australia, uh, Indonesia, and other countries with these large domestic networks, that if and when flying pardon the pun, or not, not really trying to make a pun here, but takes off again, that these domestic markets and the regional markets will return faster than international connections. Uh, would you agree with that? And what do you think it will take to restore international connectivity? A lot of people have been talking about special health certificates or some sort of vaccination record. I remember when I was younger and I started flying internationally, I had a sort of a big yellow booklet or a card that showed that I'd been vaccinated for yellow fever and things like that. Are we going to see the return of something like that before people can start flying internationally again? Um, well, you know, as you know, the travel restrictions, lockdowns, shutdowns have been imposed by governments nationally, domestically. So I think restarting domestic uh, aviation uh, is uh, going to be pretty straightforward because all the governments have to do is to relax their own rules and policies. When we start talking about cross-border travel, uh, we are confronted with a labyrinth of uh, travel restrictions because each country has done their own thing. You know, So the first thing we need to do is to come up with a, uh, a protocol of mitigation measures that are agreed multilaterally uh, that are transparent and uh, easy uh, to implement, you know, to facilitate air travel. That's one part of the equation. The second thing is that uh, the reason why uh, travel restrictions were imposed was because governments were fearful of imported cases. Now, these are cases of people contracting the virus while they are overseas, not because they are traveling on airlines, but because they contracted overseas uh, they are importing it to the country concerned. So before uh, governments can agree to open up cross-border travel, they need to be sure that uh, their populations are not going to be affected if they travel to that country or people from that country travel to their country. And uh, so we need to also agree on conditions under which uh, governments can, uh, uh, can uh, allow cross-border travel either on a multilateral basis or on a bilateral basis or small bilateral, expanding bilateral basis among uh, like-minded countries or regionally uh, to start with baby steps probably, you know, to open up uh, aviation. But it is important that these mitigation measures that are agreed are coordinated and uh, easy to implement as well as um, user-friendly. I want to come back to that in just a minute, but, but let's go ahead and talk about a few other things first. Uh, let's talk about LCCs, low-cost carriers versus legacy carriers. Uh, how well do you think each sector is going to fare during these times? You've got airlines like Scoot that's owned by Singapore Air. They've got, you know, it's a big parent company, uh, sort of, a, you know, it, it's basically a state carrier. 
uh, and the consensus is, again, from listening to all the experts in the field on these webinars that are late at night, uh, you know, Singapore is not going to let Singapore Airlines fail. Uh, China is not going to let their state carriers fail. Uh, is there a difference between the, the legacy carriers or sort of the full service carriers and the LCCs uh, in terms of survival or in terms of being able to come back faster? I think in a crisis like this, uh, all airlines are in the same boat. So we shouldn't be picking winners or, or losers. The important thing is to get the, the aviation back on its feet. You know, because right now, all the airlines are suffering uh, because of what I call suppressed demand. Travel restriction has artificially suppressed demand. Once you get uh, aviation restarted and the airlines are in shape to start flying again, then uh, you can let intrinsic demand determine the scale and nature of operations, be it uh, budget uh, airline operations or, or, or full service airline operations. Uh, back in March or late February, I can't remember which it was, airlines uh, around the world, and I think IATA had made this statement, and in a APA to a certain extent as well, uh, were calling for blanket slot relief. Um, and there, there, at that time, there seemed to be a little friction between the airline trade groups and the airport trade groups because ACI came out and said, well, it should be on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, do you think that that friction has sort of subsided a little bit and, and everybody's just trying to work together to survive? Pretty much, pretty much. I think as, uh, as the crisis proceeded, I think everyone uh, realized that, you know, we are all in the same boat, in the same situation. So my understanding is that uh, all the Asia-Pacific governments have uh, been providing relief from uh, slot uh, use rules, also exemptions for rating, certification, licensing regulations, and facilitating ad hoc operations uh, by and large. You know, uh, We just want to make sure that these uh, regulations are now uh, sort of uh, established, you know, and uh, uh, file with ICAO. Now, your organization, AAPA, as well as IATA and other trade representatives were initially against, I think your predecessor issued a fairly strong uh, statement about imposing blanket bans on international travel and closing borders uh, because organizations like the WHO had recommended against them uh, that we needed free flow of people for, you know, for uh, personal protective equipment and doctors. Uh, do you think that the the governments were wrong initially? Did the trade representatives get it wrong, or was everybody just sort of acting in their own interest at the time? Well, um, travel restrictions uh, are ill-advised. Uh, WHO has never recommended travel restrictions. But we can understand why governments have resorted to travel restrictions. Same reason why they have resorted to lockdowns and shutdowns. You know. So um, now we are at the stage of uh, trying to suppress the spread of the virus. And uh, hopefully the travel restrictions and the shutdowns and lockdowns have helped to suppress the virus. Uh, basically, uh, governments were buying time uh, to make sure that their public health facilities and uh, systems up to scratch to deal with any spike in the spread of the virus. And I think uh, we are seeing uh, you know, good signs, you know, that uh, uh, in many countries, you know, the spread of the virus are either stabilizing or, or, or declining, you know. Um, so now is the time to start talking about uh, how to remove these restrictions. We cannot wait until the uh, virus completely abates or even recedes before we start talking about how to lift travel restrictions. We have to talk about it now because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it is going to take a lot of effort uh, from governments uh, discussing multilaterally, as well as uh, with uh, uh, industry and also on the basis of advice from the medical professionals. Because whatever measures we uh, introduce must be scientifically based and must be based on a risk management uh, exercise. I'm going to skip a couple of questions here that, that I talked about because you, you bring up the coordination and that's a word that comes up more and more in every online webinar that I've been listening to 
A lot of people cite the rules that were put into place after the 9-11 attacks in New York, and it was kind of a helter-skelter fashion. Uh, one jurisdiction would say this, another jurisdiction would say that. Uh, you have to take your shoes off here. You can't carry uh, th more than three ounces of liquid there. Uh, and so there wasn't really a lot of coordination. Now, I've lived in Asia for more than 20 years, and I know how hard it is to, to get uh, an organization like ASEAN to agree on anything. I mean, it's very difficult to coordinate. How are you helping to drive that coordination? And, and again, I think I mentioned earlier that uh, your organization sent out a, a, a release yesterday, a statement uh, saying that we all need to work together. Everybody in the industry needs to work together uh, to get this going. Uh, how is that coordination going? Is it working? Yeah, precisely because of uh, what happened after 9-11, um, which was a crisis that emanated in the U.S. And the U.S. was uh, applying the rules uh, on an extra jurisdictional basis. And as they went along, they learned new things about it and uh, they introduced uh, uh, a very patchy framework of uh, security uh, uh, protocols. You know, so precisely because I learned from that experience, uh, we should uh, think twice about uh, letting each government come up with their own protocols. That's one. Secondly, um, this is a crisis that, uh, you know, is global now. You know, it's in almost every country in the world. And uh, even though the spread and the, the rate of increase have been different from country to country, more or less everyone is in the same uh, situation. So that is why it is important uh, that uh, when we open up travel, uh, because right now travel is at a standstill. Uh, when we open up travel, we have to make sure that uh, whatever protocols we uh, we come up with, uh, mitigation measures must be coordinated. They must be coherent and they must be consistent, and they must be agreed among countries. You know, under the auspices of ICAO, hopefully, as well as with inputs from the industry because uh, they have to be operationalized and the industry are the best people who can uh, provide valuable inputs into how uh, these measures can be operationalized. They must be um, uh, easy to implement, they must be user friendly and wherever possible they must be available on uh, mobile devices uh, so that passengers also have visibility uh, about what the, the measures are and uh, they also know how to uh, follow these measures. China, for instance, you know, um, have already uh, introduced some uh, health protocols for domestic travel. Uh, of course, as you know, they were the first to experience uh, the impact of this crisis. Uh, and so now they are the first to start uh, uh, opening up domestic travel. And they've already introduced some protocols for, for travel. You know? uh, but um, we don't want this to go too far. We want uh, governments to start talking about what is needed on a multilateral uh, basis. Back to the webinar is my, my favorite thing these days. Um, everybody is saying that aviation will be forever changed, not, not just by this pandemic, but by other pandemics or viruses that Mother Nature is surely going to throw at us. I mean, this is not the first time we, you know, you go back in history, uh, bubonic, you know, you had the plague, you had the, the Spanish flu. Uh, you had swine flu, you had SARS, you had MERS. So this is not going to be the last pandemic that we face. Uh, Boeing and Airbus aren't selling planes at the moment. Airport, airports are not earning landing fees or selling duty-free goods. How will the sort of the passenger experience or the infrastructure in Asia change or will it change? Or, because the human race seems to have a very short memory. Uh, but do you see the basic infrastructure changing or, or you know, I, I don't see airlines cutting out the middle seat or, you know, it, because the whole point of filling the plane is to make money. And I've been to a lot of conferences, which seemed like a long time ago, where they talk about the margins that airlines earn, which are so thin, one, participant at a, at a conference, he said an airline is a hamburger and a Coke away from losing money on, on, that, on one passenger per flight because the margins were anywhere from three U.S. dollars to 
I think, 15 or $17, which is why they were pushing all the auxiliary, you know, selling tools and everything. So is it going to be forever changed, or is the human race going to, uh, you know, five years from now forget about this and go back to the status quo? Well, I think this crisis is definitely not like any other we have experienced in this generation. Um, if you look back at SARS, um, it was concentrated in a few countries and it was shoplift. If you look at the global financial crisis, um, it was induced by the finance industry. Whereas this crisis is not induced by any industry and it is um, definitely not going to be short-lived. It's going to be prolonged and it is affecting uh, globally uh, all countries. So it is um, quite a different scenario. And until until um, you know majority of populations achieve uh, herd immunity or a vaccine is found or antiviral medication uh, tested and uh, and applied um, this this uh, uh, virus is still going to be a part of our lives so um, but we have to get on uh, with our lives and we have to start uh, looking at uh, ways to to live uh, with this virus until uh, uh, it recedes, um, hopefully not too far in the distant future. Um, so that is why we need uh, uh, to have uh, sustainable protocols uh, for medical certification, uh, sanitization and uh, hygienization of uh, airport premises. Um, uh, and maybe we can also look at some uh, practical uh, precautions that can be uh, uh, taken uh, on board uh, flights. Uh, but by and large, uh, you have to ensure that uh, the uh, safety of the health safety of the uh, passenger uh, is taken care of uh, uh, upstream in the passenger travel process before he boards the plane. Um, this is to to uh, ensure that uh, all possible precautions have been taken, and uh, this will also help to restore confidence uh, in. Uh, the air travelers, uh, that uh, the authorities have done uh, whatever is necessary uh, to ensure their safety and their safe passage. Let me, let me, let me follow up on that very quickly yeah. because I just read a, an interesting study by CAPA, one of their, one of their research units, where uh, the, there were two things. One, it was passenger trust is going to be very difficult to restore uh, because obviously nobody wants to get the disease. Nobody wants to get sick, uh, so they're saying, you know, well, I can wait six months to fly to go see grandma or grandpa or, or whoever. Uh, and number two, uh, financially speaking, you know, the world is, everybody, if you listen to the financial analysts, uh, we're facing a recession at least as great as what would happen during 2008, 2009, if not worse, uh, the longer this goes on. Uh, so, you know, how, how, do, how do airlines restore that trust? Is it more communications? Uh, is it telling people, here's what the situation is, here's how we handled cleaning the aircraft? Uh, is it that, or is there more to it? Well, I think uh, the travel restrictions, the lockdown, shutdowns imposed by governments have played into the, in the fear factor. You know, so that's one. Number two, of course, uh, all um, uh, businesses, uh, you know, all um, uh, uh, industries are doing poorly. So that has affected the livelihoods of people. Uh, maybe even some have lost their jobs, you know. So that is also um, affecting, uh, you know, disposable income. So if you, if you do a survey now, I think the sentiment will be uh, pretty negative. But... Um, Coming up with the, uh, the, the protocols to restart uh, aviation is part of the uh, restoration of confidence because uh, it shows that the governments are, are confident enough uh, in their health systems uh, to start uh, aviation again. That's one part of it. Secondly, if they see that uh, the um, protocols that they have to follow or abide by are not very difficult, uh, at the same time, you know, uh, takes care of their innermost fears, uh, then they will be uh, more confident 
you know, that this thing has been thought through uh, and uh, implemented in an effective way. And thirdly, um, we also have to um, look at uh, um, the uh, way in which we communicate all this information uh, to potential air travelers. Um, it should not be, um, uh, you know, based on rasmates or, or, you know, just uh, um, uh, the usual communication uh, uh, activities, you know, that uh, businesses conduct. But it must be informative. It must be uh, based on uh, uh, support and advice by medical uh, professionals. You know, um, if if uh, the doctors, you know, uh, for instance, the doctors are able to say it's safe to fly if you are safe to fly. You know, for instance, you know that sort of uh, uh, communication will will start to restore confidence in air travelers that this is an activity that they can start again. And as you say. The human race, you know, cannot be tied down or locked down uh, for too long without uh, uh, it affecting their well-being. And businesses also have to restart. And aviation is is a conduit for economic, social, and tourism development. You know, so it is a driver of economic, social, and and uh, tourism development. So once we restart aviation, it also will be a help uh, in uh, uh, boosting uh, livelihoods, in boosting income in boosting uh, confidence in businesses uh, and also many sectors that are dependent on tourism. Uh, for instance, retail sector that is dependent on uh, footfall. Uh, all these will also pick up and that uh, will also help the uh, financial side of things. I, I think we heard a good sign. Was that an airplane flying near your house there? Or, or do yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I live in the east of Singapore. so. Uh, once in a while, we hear these uh, green shoots. Okay. No, yeah. It was very interesting. It was kind of funny. Um, last couple of questions. Assistance or aid to airlines. Uh, some people call them bailouts. Uh, you know, maybe that's a bad term. I don't know. But it's, it, it's a big topic. Uh, your organization, IATA, IKO, others have called for direct loans, loan guarantees, tax relief, uh, things like that. Uh, and, and some of these have already started uh, in the U.S., in Singapore, uh, in other places, uh, because the industry supports so many jobs. Uh, is there one thing in particular that the, whether you're an, an airport or an airline or a, a catering company or a ground handling company or a cargo company, is there one thing that those companies are looking for, or is it just the whole package? Um, I think I think most governments uh, have already provided uh, you know relief in terms of taxes, fees, charges, you know the simple things that they can do. They have already done it. Um, uh, basically, um, uh, lifelines for airlines from governments depends on. On two things, two things. You know, one, um, uh, basically, how important is aviation uh, to the countries? I believe in Asia, aviation is a very important uh, aspect of uh, uh, of life. You know, uh, most of the Asian countries depend on uh, trade and tourism uh, for their income and GDP growth. You know, so. I think there is a willingness uh, from the, on the part of governments to help the airlines. And of course, the second factor is the, the ability of governments uh, uh, to help their airlines. You know? Of course, this varies from country to country. Right now, the airlines are focused more on uh, safeguarding the livelihoods and jobs uh, of their populations. So they have been forthcoming in terms of wage support. Uh, in terms of helping businesses to cope with the crisis so that they can survive it. So that, that helps uh, a great deal because that is part of the standing cost that uh, airlines are facing. Uh, and other aspects of uh, assistance are under discussion. You know, and I think this is, this is an ongoing uh, matter. Uh, airlines are in deep discussions with their governments. And uh, as long as the governments feel that you know, aviation is an important sector, I think they will do as much as they can to help the airlines. I actually think it's a good omen to hear the airlines, to hear the airplanes flying over during, yeah. <laughs> during the during this interview. It's a it's a good sign that somebody's flying somewhere. 
Uh, Sue Voss, I usually like to end these conversations on a bright note. I know this is a serious time for the industry. Not, not only are people dying, and, and that's tragic, uh, but millions are facing job losses. Uh, again, probably a deep recession. Uh, aviation is going to have to change to deal with the new world. But is there a bright spot out there that you see for Asian airlines, for, for the industry in general in Asia? Is there anything good that can come out of this? Well, generally, the whole world is, is reeling from this crisis. Uh, so I think uh, going forward, uh, Asia, Asia Pacific was the first region uh, that uh, confronted this uh, pandemic, you know, starting with China and spreading to other countries in Asia. So and Asia uh, was where uh, previous such uh, crisis uh, occurred you know, be it SARS or H1N1. So they have uh, uh, some experience. So I think Asia Pacific can can uh, contribute significantly to the recovery and the restart effort, you know, because they have experience and uh, they have also, uh, they are also seeing some, uh, some uh, good signs, you know, that uh, they are coming out of this crisis, it's stabilizing and uh, their efforts are, are paying dividends, you know. So they can contribute uh, to the, the global recovery. If anything, I think this crisis is a good opportunity to showcase uh, globalization. Forget about trade wars and all these other uh, difficulties that we experienced in the past. Let us all come together in a concerted effort to, to beat this crisis and come out on the other side uh, in better shape. Subhas Menon, Director General, the newly installed Director General who was thrown into the into the fire immediately. Uh, Director General of the Association of Asia Pacific Airlines, thanks for your time today. And as everyone is saying these days, stay safe. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Uh, same to you. Stay safe and uh, really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you.